something. This is the generative commons call for Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. Um, our goal in these calls is to figure out what a generative commons means, looks like, sounds like, how organizations might sign up for it or agree to it or pledge their troth to it or something like that. Um, and the generative commons, just to sort of review a little bit, uh, is the idea that we're here to improve the commons, to garden it, curate it, uh, leave it behind for other people uh, in a better state than it was, make it more useful than it was. And we also need to make a living while doing so. So our bias is toward openness, that we also have to obey privacy in different ways uh, and um, figure out how to thread that, thread that path between uh, sharing lots of information and uh, keeping the world sort of uh, bound and tight in different ways. Um, and Jack, we're seeing you, but not hearing you. That's because I was out of the room. Ah, that explains everything. Uh, yeah, and I have a driving test this morning, so I don't get to stay here the full measure. Okay, okay, and, and wish you well for the driving test. <laughs> At my age, they make it, it's now called a vision driving test. And I have no idea what that means. Huh. Maybe they can do it all in, in VR now. You just put on goggles and sit somewhere. Oh, and... you wish. Well, no, it's, it's, it's usually some fat old 1960s hippie sitting next to you. And he's saying, yo, cool, man, cool. And pick it right here and, and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so for me, it's an amusing an amusing event. You drive, uh, make a couple of right turns, a couple of left turns, you get on the freeway for about 500 feet, blah, 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 and you're home. And you're home. Now, because it's got some kind of a vision component, I guess they're going to, I have no idea. It's going to be interesting. I do, I do remember um, flunking my first driving test uh, awesome. be, because uh, there was a lady in the neighborhood who uh, sort of, they, the, the DMV kind of intentionally asked her to grow her, <clears throat> her shrubbery big out onto the street. <clears throat> so it was kind of obstructive and they, all, they would always drive by there. And if you didn't kind of inch your way out, if you, if you just kind of stopped and went, uh, boom, uh, you know, let's, let's go back to the DMV. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I see that coming, but, but uh, the, the, only, the only time I screwed up is I did a California stop and, on, on my my first right turn and <laughs> I thought oh crap and mm -hmm. and of course he you know he didn't yell and make me turn around but but he did ding me for you know you got demerits yeah I got demerits now I hope he doesn't make me do one of those parallel parking things I've I have yet to see them do that but uh but he, he I'm in, I have a Prius and the 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 back vision on a Prius is just horrible so it's it's doesn't have a camera and is the camera no good yep no the camera is good but but because <coughs> when you look back you can't really see very much but you you, you yeah the, the the back window is is like yeah it's like a sports it, car it's more like a tank than than a regular yeah, it's vehicle. like a tank and yeah <clears throat> and it and it uh it, it's it's very difficult it should come with like a little prismatic turret on top that you can just spin around. That would, like they could borrow a tank innovation. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark's got the idea right there. <coughs> well, oh, periscope. Yeah, exactly. It's periscope, arm torpedoes. And, and the advanced models, the luxury models could have photon torpedoes for bad traffic. Well, yeah, there's, yeah. Or not. I mean, we don't need to go that way that probably would make a mess of traffic but still i think you need a disintegrator to just remove the atoms a dematerializer or or better well, more, or, more orderly a rematerializer i simply want to have pop a rotor and just take off and you know i've, I've long you know ever since i was in college studying aeronautical engineering i i dreamed of a, of a you know going down the freeway and just lifting off and well, there was a moment in the 30s, I think, maybe 40s, 
well, but early, like I think pre-war, where everybody figured out that helicopters were really inexpensive to make and everybody was picturing there would be just urban and suburban helicopter travel. They and, were. and everybody would like own a simple chopper and you could fold the rotors. You could you could tuck an air, a helicopter in your garage much faster than you could tuck an airplane because the auto car, the, the flying car has been a thing forever and never really worked. And there's like five models you could go buy today and good luck to you as well. Um, but the chopper thing, you know, and now we're getting the, the multi-bladed cop, uh, choppers, like the hexacopters, quadcopters and all that, and some of them electric. And some of this is actually really viable, like really viable for short-term transportation. The, your problem is air traffic control, noise, and uh, privacy. Yeah. And liability, when things fall out of the sky, it's a little harder hit than when you just bump in the corner. Yeah, people don't understand that flying an airplane of any kind is not like driving a car. You just don't pull over to the curb when something's wrong. You know what I mean? Bingo. Exactly. Exactly. It really is you and your maker up there. And if you screw up, you're made. You're done. You're, you meet your maker. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a meet and greet. It's like speed dating. Um, yeah. And one reason why I never um, learned to fly, although I was tempted a couple of times in life, was... Uh, and the same thing for rock climbing is that I don't want my epitaph to say Jerry died doing something completely optional. <laughs> oh, that's interesting because I tried to die doing that completely optional. I crashed an airplane I built once, but oh, nice. Oh, you built the kit plane? No, I built it from scratch. I bought a set of plans and oh my and, god, and built it. Uh, I can I can send you a link to a video of me test flying somebody else's of the same model. As uh, plywood or plexiglass or what? Aluminum. Aluminum? Two two seater all all aerobatic uh, low wing sports plane. Aerobatic aluminum aircraft hand built. Yeah. Holy crap! Okay, that's really cool. Um, I did that right out of high school, and and uh, I flew it for about three years and then stacked it in Shasta Lake. So is it still lying in Shasta Lake somewhere? No, I, I hired a boat to, to pull it up. It was, it was down in uh, 70 feet of water and they, they hooked a, tied a rope around the, the, the tail wheel and, and used a speedboat to, to pull it over to a ramp and and then we tied the rope to a car and it pulled it up and awesome that's cool thank you I, I had no idea about that part of your past um I was uh, on topic for the call I was going to ask you to just free associate on the topic because you've been at this for a really long time which topic uh, the generative commons topic, not the how do we overcome traffic uh, with aircraft topic. Yeah, well, they're the same because the air is a commons, and, and yep. how are we going to use it? You know what I mean? It's it's and and we don't use it well already. Yes. And and so so uh, I have a lot of faith in a small percentage of human humankind to do the right thing and a terribly low faith in, in the rest of the people. I just don't think it, it's almost as if they don't want to do the right thing. So then, which begs the question, why a commons? Who is the commons for? Is it just for, for the elite who, who get it or is it trying to save everybody? It's trying to save everybody. Yeah. Well, I, that's I'm on that mission, but it's there. There are times when, you know, you you run into. I have, you know, this 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 nurse at the at uh, Kaiser the other day, and I told her that it was only a matter of time before Kaiser mandates uh, um, COVID vaccinations for for providers, and she says, "Boy, they better not!" And she just started screaming. Wow. <clears throat> wow. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so my my part of my amateur theory of history and humans is that we are stupider than we normally would be as humans because we're being we've been treated as mere consumers for a hundred years. Yeah. And that and that makes us really dumb. It makes us stupid. It makes us <laughs> easy to manipulate. And also, um, we don't have a shared memory, which makes us stupider as well. So the the compounding, bless you. Um, the compounding of those factors has, has uh, made us more like the movie Idiocracy than any other like interesting kind of cooperative uh, scenario. 
Um, but, I, but my amateur theory of history also includes the fact that those bands of humans who didn't manage to kill themselves off, which humans were very good at back in the day, um, actually learned how to live in community on the commons. And they passed that wisdom down orally, which is not respected by writing traditions. They're like, no way they could have known all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, they understood very deeply what, what things would heal, heal you in the forest and what would kill you, um, how to, how to uh, tune the landscape to optimize it for food and shelter and resources and everything else, uh, et cetera. Not that there wasn't occasional fighting, but that the, the, the more intelligent of us managed to live really well and, and didn't spend a lot of time gathering food and had, I think, a pretty interesting existence. And many of those cultures were matrilineal, not patrilineal. There's a whole bunch of other funky things there. Anyway, my amateur and naive hope is that leaving interesting things at hand that actually might resolve some of those issues, like, hey, we're about to have an argument, but there's a, there's a widget that just popped up on my phone that says, instead of an argument, consider doing this. And, and we've just ordered you for free. We've ordered you like a couple beers uh, and there's a table like, like to your right, just go sit there and answer these four questions with each other and see how that works. I don't know, I'm making that up, but, but, but what if wisdom from all the different, you know, wisdom which is prisoner in little books around the world was instead loose in the commons and, and then instrumented to be available and useful at, at point of, a point of need, um, what if that were the, the case? Wouldn't that help up our game as humans? So let me inject my theory of the commons that, that, that builds on. It, this is not a yes, but it's a yes. And. Uh, and I'm very pleased it's not a complete refutation. So please proceed. Um, look, there's an old saying, it's the people, stupid. Yes. And, and I believe that to be the case. Now you were talking about which is different from it's the stupid people. I'll point that out. Keep that's the point. I mean, somebody said it's the economy stupid. Well, actually, the economy is based on the people. So it's the people stupid. Let's get it right now. That's reductionist thinking, but it's, it's, it's reductionist in a very complex way because of all of the feedback loops. Yep. Um, the, the, my, my, look. Engelbart had it the clearest picture. He was, you know, he was passionate about technology, but he was more passionate about people. Mm -hmm. He called them the human systems and the tool systems. And he wanted to put them together. And he called the, the combination of the human systems and the tool systems and the knowledge in there, that was called a dynamic knowledge repository. And, and, and when I, I went to uh, Korea to talk about DKRs, Ted Kahn read my speech and says, oh, God, no, don't call it a dynamic knowledge repository, call it a dynamic knowledge garden. So that's what I said in my speech. And, and it, 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 it took root, but the Korean said, would you drop dynamic? We like two words. And so it became knowledge garden, which is a term that everybody used for kindergartens and children's schools and so on and so forth. And now everybody uses it for everything they do, you know? So knowledge gardening is out there. No, I didn't invent the term, nor did Ted Kahn, but, but together we sort of brought it into the conversation at an HR forum in, in, in Seoul in 2007. And, and the whole point of gardening is the people and the plants, the things they do in the garden and their social interactions and the plants have roots and they form growing interactions, they form relationships. So it's, it's all relational and that's the key point. And, and people who deny that climate is changing or people who claim that they don't want to, um, to take a, a vaccine are not being relational, be, they're being very self-centered and, and that's okay, that's who we are. We're people and people. it's the people, stupid. And so I figured somewhere along the way, I figured if you're talking about commons still, how are you going to have a commons if people don't know how to behave in it? Now, it is true that, that, that um, you spoke of people historically forming commons. Yeah, they, they were called tribes. And, and the great religions were one of the things that exploded in the middle of that. 
Murray Bookchin um, used to say, he said, you know, the original, the origins of, of, of uh, religion started in the, in the, um, in the um, uh, rainmakers. He said, picture yourself, you're a child and your father's the rainmakers for your tribe and he gets stoned to death because he didn't bring the rain. And so now you've become the de facto rainmaker and in a few years into it, you find out that uh, you didn't get any rain and here they come with the stones and what do you do? You think about it for a while and before they start throwing stones, you say, the gods are angry with you. This it's your fault. Your it's you, not me. It's not on me. It's on you. And thus was born the idea of some higher entity in control of stuff. And damn it, you better not piss them off. Why rain and why not uh, the animals didn't show up on season this year? Why, why, why is it rain? Look, I can't speak for Murray, Murray Books, and I don't even think he's alive anymore. Yeah, but... he's been dead a while, I think. He, uh, he, he invited me to teach summer school with him at, at Vermont a bunch of years ago. And that's when Sweet. I met him and heard his, his lecture. And I take it as stock, you know, that's what he said. Now, am I claiming that he was quoting from scripture himself? I don't think so. It's probably an invention of his. I don't know. I, I didn't do any due diligence on the claim. I just like it and it sounds right. It feels good. Cool. And, and so I, I'm totally on board with that logic. Yeah. And so so I'm not I'm not saying it's it's I'm not pontificating here. I'm just using it as a story to say this is how commons used to work. And and, you know, um, yeah, we we get, uh, you know, from from Navajos and, and American natives and so on and so forth that they had commonses and although they were tribes and they were separate tribes and this and that and the other thing now how come they're not in and i i i actually think that silos and tribes are are beneficial they represent a belief system a mechanism a social thing and what we need to do is not kill them not take down the walls but to allow them to federate. And thus I begin to talk about knowledge federation. How do you share? What can you share into the commons? Now I'm talking now about a global federation, which is a kind of a global commons. And I tend to think that's what you talk about when you're talking about a commons. And yes, I support that 1000% and not to the detriment or anything, the danger of the existing private trot tribal commons, okay? I want them to stay. I believe they exist. I'm not sure I believe that borders should exist, phys physical land borders, because they aren't physical. They're just marks on a piece of paper and an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but be that as it may, I'm, I'm interested in federation. And for the knowledge commons, which is my focus, which lies at that intersection of human systems and tool systems. That's where I put my work and you asked me to talk about that. Um, and when, so I, I'm asking in the middle of all of this, why should I go and try and make topic maps of everything if people can't put in decent, you know, let's, let's just say not dishonest factors into the knowledge commons. So I got to thinking it, you know, we need to build a place where people can improve themselves because Engelbart talked about improvement communities and he was speaking about improving human systems and improving tool systems. Well, let's, let's focus for a minute on improving human systems. And, I, and so when, uh, when uh, I had just finished doing a, a research enough to defend the PhD thesis proposal, on, on a topic that I call taming conversations using IT, um, I had done a lot of studying of World of Warcraft and their guilds and the sociology and the mechanics and the dynamics and so on and so forth of, of role-playing games and avatars and guilds and so on and so forth. So when Martin Radley um, stood up at a, at a uh, at a, at a conversation meeting in Palo Alto at eight in the morning uh, 
uh, in 2010 and said, um, how, ca how, can, how can we have civil conversations online about politics? Everybody in the room said, you need to talk to Park. And so we had coffee on, on that morning. And I said, he said, what's your answer? And I said, World of Warcraft meets global sense making. And in that, in my mind, in that instance, which is one of the ways I'm, I'm somewhat creative, it's usually in a conversation and just things, things emerge that weren't pre-planned, but they were clearly preceded. In other words, there were the, all the ideas were there, all the ducks were there, and they just lined up in the conversation. I just said, you need what avatars and guilds bring to the table. That is the discipline of behaving in a guild in, in concert with other members, learning how to collaborate, learning, learning how to do deep listening and all of the rest of it. And that was the day we formed Topic Quest. And so I'm on that mission. It's the people, stupid. And I, I, as, as you know, um, uh, I, I now call it Quest as a service. It's, it's, a, it's a, an emerging technology um, which, which allows people to join guilds and to go on quests about matters that matter. This is not about legends of Gelda and all of the rest of it, where you're going in caves and driving tanks and you know, shooting and killing. This is about finding the best answers you can to the quest. And then having a conversation, not a pissing contest, but a conversation, which includes elements of debate, in a structured conversation with other guilds. That's, that's, that's the platform. And it's, it's about growing a generation or two of people who could actually not vote for Donald Trump. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would see through him the moment he started talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was raising kids, we, we would have them sit and watch commercials on TV and I would ask them, what, what, what do you think of what he's saying? And I would get them to think things through way below the surface of what the commercial was trying to tell you. And, and that's, what, it, that's what, what doing quests on, on matters that matter, climate change, women's rights, voting rights, blah, 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 you name it. Uh, will get people to do. That's kind of my big picture. What I call it is is pride of ownership. You mm -hmm. know, when when a real estate take a real estate salesman takes you around and says, "Oh, you you want to see this?" What they what they do is they park you across the street to look over the curb view of the home and get you to feel like, "Oh my God, I really want to own that." You know what I'm saying? And, and they'll usually do it in the evening rather than the day when, when you can't see the potholes on the road and all the rest of it. And, and, and they speak of pride of, you're gonna be so proud of owning this home. And what I want you to be is proud of owning the knowledge it, it allowed you to think things through. That's a different kind of psychology than pride of owning a cigarette lighter that's gold plated, you know what I mean? We gotta fix the people, damn it. I remember when I moved to Connecticut, a realtor showed me a place and, and immediately a couple of days after I realized that they had driven to the place through the scenic route. Yep. And the front, that, that access to the place was, was beautiful and idyllic and right behind it was like crap and the railroad and yep. a, a yep. horrible neighborhood. Yep. And it's like, yeah, they were, it was strategic. Um, so, so one of the reasons I hate the word consumer and that I'm, so happy to have discovered that years ago is that I believe that treating us as mere consumers disconnected us from one another because your job as a consumer is to consume more stuff. And yep. if, you if you share the stuff, that's not good for the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so by disconnecting us from each other, it took away our, our, response, our sense of mutual responsibility. Uh, it stopped the passing of wisdom and knowledge along community lines. It deprecated community to the point where Margaret Thatcher is famously quoted as saying, there is no such thing as society, uh, all those kinds of things. 
and that and that so so having been treated as mere consumers for 100 years has has sort of weakened our state and and not just impoverished us mentally but separated us intentionally where rugged individualism is like the norm and that that couples itself really nicely to the american dream rugged individualism personal freedom all that kind of thing like and if you can harness these things and yoke them to some dark purpose like maintaining power as a minority party over the you know most powerful country on earth which is sort of what's happening right now it plays out well like like there's they're able right now the senate is sort of in lockup because manchin is saying like 3.5 trillion little big maybe maybe one and everybody's like holy shit um and that's you know and and that's because right over right opposite the on the other side of that precipice is kevin mccarthy and and mitch mcconnell and the rest of the of the american republican party which is apparently um, i've got a thought in my brain the gop has become a suicide cult uh because the party that has nothing to lose in a contest is the one that's more likely to win this is this is this is all very interesting you have to remember that bush too stood at ground zero and said don't let them win go back to shopping mm -hmm. and and uh mansion is to me a very interesting study mm -hmm. He, he claims to be a moderate and he's behaving like a moderate. Now, the, those, those people who are out in the skirts on the left hate him because he's not out in the skirts, he's closer to the center of the bell. Mm -hmm. and, and he's arguing for what the center would normally argue for and that's moderation. But the times don't really need moderation at the moment. We need to kickstart something that's, that's clearly in trouble. But there is a reality. We're saddling our children with what that means in terms of, you know, the debt has to be paid. It's not going to go away by itself. Nobody's going to wave a magic wand. You saw the title of the article I just went through. He told us to go shopping. Now the bill is due. And now the bill is due. Yes. And, and, and so there's a part of me that, that really, really um, wants to defend Manchin's moderate stance. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a part of me that says, but he needs to find a way to moderate his moderate stance and mm -hmm. start to learn how to make exceptions. Right. And, but at least he's there. He's one of the few that's there that's trying to bring things back to the middle. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's my view. Like, exactly. And um, <clears throat> what's their name? Ann Coulter. Uh, I'm strangely enough, I'm going to bring Ann Coulter into the conversation right now. Um, oops, I think there's no E and N. Um, so Ann Coulter serves a really, or used to serve, like in the 80s, 90s, used to serve an incredibly powerful, uh, uh, she was the, the Kellyanne before Kellyanne Conway. Um, Ann Coulter served this incredibly uh, powerful uh, role in that she's one of the rights culture warriors, uh, in that she writes a book called Treason, Liberal Treachery from the Cold War to the War on Terrorism. She basically says liberals are traitors, guilty liberal victims in their assault on America, et cetera, et cetera. She puts a stake so far out on the right, short of let's kill them all, short of just recommending genocide. But she puts a stake so far out on the right that humans average, we normalize, we sort of go, oh, well, the truth must be a little, a little closer toward that. And there were, there were multiple people doing this, in fact, there was a whole media apparatus to do this created intentionally by the right, by the far right. There's a, the whole echo chamber of the far right that worked and it continues to work uh, to the point where interrupting it, dismantling it, figuring out how to get back to reasoned conversation about stuff where we might differ on, on tactics, but not on the end goals would be a, would be a lovely thing to start approaching. But we, you know, I've got a bunch of uh, clips of, of videos uh, uh, I've got I've got a resistance to masking and vaccination hits new ugly highs and there's some you know some, there's some people uh, basically showing up at school boards and, and city councils and stuff like that 
going nuts and threatening people who are just trying to do their jobs, who didn't, who are not getting paid enough to take this kind of risk, never mind abuse, uh, because this is starting to go violent. So sorry to sorry to wander off uh, off into the fields for a second, but I just want to say that this this set of misunderstandings pumped intentionally has extremely uh, serious consequences that, that we're busy suffering through this, this month, like right now. So I want to continue on the thing about commons and talk to you about a topic that I, I understand this group is interested in and it's basically IP rights. Yes, I was going to steer you there if you weren't heading that way. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't have much time left. Oh, and, that's right. You've got to go. And uh, and so you've got to go show them that you're baby driver. That may not be a reference for you, but well, going to the DMV is is to me is 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 very stressful. You know what I'm saying? I do. And 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 uh, it 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 used to be worse. When you actually finally get to a to to a counter and talk to a human, they're pretty civil now. They weren't always, but they're they're pretty damn civil now. But it's the process of getting to the counter and getting it, blah blah. It's that's that's a major event. Um, By the way, good morning, Jack. Good, good morning, you. Mark. It's really great <laughs> to see you. Damn. It, yeah, just Mark is just one of my favorite people. You know what I'm saying? Yay. Well, can I just take this minute, Jack, to say that there have been at least five times that I've been talking and my friend Sam Hahn has said, you should talk to Jack, or not you should talk to, he said, Jack Park has something he thinks just like that. That's what he says so many times. So I'm so happy you're on the call because well, I understand now why he said that. <laughs> With that introduction, I'm delighted that you're on the call as well. Sam is another one of my really favorite people. Same here. So, so, uh, and, and he lives on this really gorgeous island up, <laughs> up no, further I north than Jerry. You know what I mean? But and and it, you know, I've spent some time there, and it's 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 really. I I I wouldn't mind moving there if I could get away with it. And he's trying but, to get me to visit, but I still have a dog. So it, until until. But he Something has dogs. Just, Bring your dog with you. I have no way. I would have to. I'm in New York, so I would have well, to that's drive. Problems. That's um, a big drive. <laughs> well, dogs can go on airplanes, but that's too stressful for them. Mm -hmm. Right. I used to be able to go with him on my lap, but they just changed that. That's all changed. Yeah, and and it's you have to drug them to put them on a plane. Now they have to be vacuum sealed. It's <clears> not <throat> happening. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> Never mind. So, oh, thank so, you. So back to IP. We, we have this thing called open source. And open source got kind of mutated to something called FOSS or free and open source. And so when you say open source now, everybody assumes that it's free and open source. And the, the GNU people are, are kind of the, the, the globe's Nazis on that whole idea of free and open source. Um, and, and in that space, the, there, there are licenses on the software that you can put out. The first one, basically, um, the, the earliest licenses obviously came from MIT, and they basically say, don't sue us. That's about all they say. Your right to use this is go for it and enjoy and make babies and have fun and don't sue us. Uh, and, and, and then Berkeley sort of added a few little statements. Now they said you could make three babies and that kind of stuff, but it's still the same, totally permissive. And then Apache came along, a foundation that, that sort of hosts thousands of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of projects. The Apache license was really the kind of like the Berkeley BSD MIT license. And but then the GNU people uh, came up with the GPU, General Public something, GPL, General GPL. Public. And, and, and it had, a, it was draconian. It, it became what was known as a viral license. And the viral license basically said, yeah, you can do anything you want with this, but 
if you use it in any product you make, that product also has to be GNU public license. In other words, you can't just wire commercial private stuff to our platform. Now, the only sort of major exception to that is Linux. And Linux is GPL'd in the internals, but they allow you to use it through what are called calls, API calls. And so you didn't actually compile your software against their code, you compile it against their call structure. And so that means you can put even a commercial private proprietary thing on top of, of Linux and, you know, uh, lots and lots and lots of, of people do that. Um, but but uh, what happened was, is that the way the GPL license was worded, it said, if you publish. Now, publish to them in those days meant you put it on the web and let people download it, the software. But it didn't cover the fact that you used it except you were only use it as a server and nobody could actually see your code. And so the Afro company said, oh, wait a minute. Um, we're going to write the AGPL, which added another thing, which extended publish to mean if you turn it on as a server and other people can access the server. Okay, and so that was that was the Ebola of viral licenses. It's just really, really nasty. So along comes Neo4j, which was a, a, a Java graph database that ultimately be, it was basically the Rolls Royce of, of, of graph databases. It's really professional, really powerful. And they had what they called the community version, which was GPL. And then they made what they called the enterprise version, and that was a GPL. And they thought that was good enough. Except that they thought that one of their business models was they were going to do Neo4j graph clouds except that uh, Amazon thought that was a pretty cool business model. So they just opened a bunch of Neo4j clouds. They just made it a cloud platform in, in the AWS offerings, which took away the business from Neo4j. So Neo4j just took the enterprise version off the market. They, except they left it on GitHub. And so somebody went down and found the last of the enterprise versions, brought it up and reproductized it under a different name. Seriously, I didn't know Seriously. Sorry. However, there is a difference. What that, that last version of Neo4j that's, that's available is something called opengraph.org or something like that, um, is not what you can get today if you buy the enterprise version. They've completely rewritten it. Okay, fast forward to MongoDB, AGPL all along, no problem. And the way AGPL people would get around people wailing and moaning about it was they would make Apache licensed clients for it. <clears throat> so now you could use MongoDB and not make everything you do viral because um, you're talking to it through an Apache uh, client. And that's pretty cool. So Mongo went out and did everything right and, and, and became extraordinarily popular and they opened their Mongo cloud. And then of course, Amazon cloned it and put it online. So now there's a Mongo cloud at, at Amazon. And, and uh, so, so, so Mongo, by the way, the same thing happened to Elasticsearch. They weren't even viral. I think they were. I think that they were Apache, or they were, they were something other than than AGPL, uh, and because uh, I used it a lot, and and uh, all of a sudden Amazon is making Elastic Clouds, and uh, so both Elasticsearch and Ada and, and Mongo 
uh, relicensed their product to what's what they call something like a server side license. It is still technically open source, but it's not free anymore. In other words, you can use it all you want, but the minute you start making money with it, they want a piece of it, which mm -hmm. in my mind is fair. Okay, in my mind is fair, but it goes against the commons Nazis that think, no, that's not free, damn you, you're, you've, you've violated the whole trust of the whole ecosystem, which is not true, but it's the mantra today. It's, it's what people are saying. And, and you wanted to talk about the commons. I'm telling you, it's not a trivial topic. Um, I uh, thank you for that path. Um, and in particular, I knew little bits and pieces of this as I've been showing with the brain, like I, you know, I have, uh, I have all these entities in there, but I don't have the thread connected to how a Pharaoh changes things and the AGPL and, and all those different angles to it. And I didn't realize that when things are using Linux, they're firewalling themselves legally by making calls rather than you know, connecting closer, that the APIs provided legal uh, insulation in some sense uh, that, that allows this ecosystem to work, right? That's really interesting. I didn't know that. I've never looked at sort of the legal, I, I know about the, the, the GNU GPL being uh, viral. I know about, you know, it, people were really corporate lawyers, startup lawyers were really worried about using or touching anything GNU related, lest the rest of their software suddenly be infected like ICE-9 and suddenly be in the commons legally. They didn't want that, that's for sure. We, when we did uh, Kalo at, uh, at, at SRI, um, we, we, we told the DOD we were gonna make, it's, it's, it's fundamentally a semantic desktop uh, uh, open source. And they said, what license? And they said, you can't use GPL. Now let's go back to GPL for a moment. <clears throat> um, Remember the Apache license did not have anything about it that was beyond the idea of, of have a good time and don't sue us. Mm -hmm. uh, except the, the GPL license had, had, a, uh, had one clause in it that even Doug Engelbart asked me about. And it was the clause that said, basically, if you do anything with this product, that you patent it and the patent blocks us from the use of this, this, this software, your right to use this software is null and void. So basically a dead man switch on, on the a use dead of man the software. Switch on patenting and blocking, okay? Right, right, right. Which, well, which... Apache finally got religion and put that clause in the license and it's now called the Apache 2 license. Ah. which didn't exist when, when, um, when, when Kalo was being built. And so we went to what is called the GNU Jeep LGPL license, which is called the lesser. library or lesser GPL license. Cool. And it is not viral. It has all of the clauses of GPL except the viral clauses, which makes it functionally the equivalent of a, of a well-written Apache 2. Huh. And so, so we used the LGPL license on, on, um, on, on our project uh, called Open Iris for, for, for the DOD on the Kalo project. So here's Kalo and here's Iris. Yes. And I don't know if I have Open Iris. Well, yes, Open Iris here's, was the, uh, the website we gave it, openiris.org. Here's, here's Open Iris. I didn't put a web, a web link to it back then, but I have the, hmm. the link. And here's the Iris Semantic Desktop. And I, I, here's Adam I, Chire. Yeah, and, and Adam Chire is the one that set up Open Iris. And for a while it was taken offline, but it may be back online. I don't recall. Yep. Apparently he's a Rubik's Cube champion. And he was a Rubik's Cube champion. And he's, he's actually a magician. Oh really? And he actually did a show. Who who are the two the the two the two uh, Penn and Teller? 
Penn and Teller. The, he, yeah, he, they have a show where you they fool us or something like that. Fool me, fool us. And, and and he did, and and he used a card deck as Siri, and he did a magic trick, uh, with with uh, uh, on their show, uh, and and um, in fact, uh, he no, he didn't fool them. So here's the Penn and Teller show. Penn and Teller fool us. And so he did. He did it. Adam Trier did a did a, an episode of that. Cool. So here's a guy named Julio Marino who did fool them with some sleight of hand, some close in magic tricks. Anyway, um, super cool. And before you have to go, because uh, I think you probably your your timer is probably running out right now. Um, so what's a fair way to for practitioners to make a living and organizations to make a living while sharing as much as possible? Uh, separate from organizations that are just going to sell code and access to code, which you've covered really, really, really well here. Well, so the, this, is a, this is a field which is now becoming known as professional open source. And, and um, to me, the signature professional open source was um, JBoss, jboss.org, jboss.com. JBoss was four French guys that, that decided to implement the Java Enterprise Edition. Sun went and put the specification for J2EE online. <laughs> but they declared it wasn't going to be open source because it was going to be Sun's way of making money. <clears throat> Except a whole bunch of little companies went and started making open source versions of J2EE. And JBoss was one of them. And Scott McNeely went around and got most all of them to shut down. Wow. Except the, the JBoss people said, no, we're not going to do it. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of online lore about the pissing contest that happened over that. Never mind. The point is, is that JBoss became one of the most powerful open source web server platforms ever made to the extent that you know that, that IBM went and um, started using the Apache server for mm -hmm. the IBM server. And in fact, IBM did the right things. They, they dropped uh, what a half a million dollars into the Apache foundation and made major improvements to the source code and gave those back to the Apache people. Well, the license required that they do that. And so, so when HP went looking for something to compete with Microsoft SQL Server, they took JBoss. So you see, there was this whole thing going on with JBoss. It was powerful. I can remember at one, one point, um, JBoss had more downloads at SourceForge than there were PCs in America. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was just being downloaded. I know I downloaded it four or five times because mm -hmm. I kept making improvements. Um, wait a sec. Sorry. Give me a second. Yep. Yep. Give me a second. Hey, your warranty is out of date. You could renew it with by following yes. this spam call. That that's the one. And yep. um, so so um, so. And and by the way, just to interrupt your story for a second. I have a whole. I interviewed uh, Bob LeBlanc back in the day, uh, an IBMer who was kind of on duty when IBM woke up and adopted Apache Linux. Uh, and then started contributing Eclipse to the world. So I, I know a bunch about that particular piece of the story. Yeah, no, and, and it's an awesome story. There are times when, you know, IBM did all the right things. And, and uh, uh, if they open sourced um, Watson, that would be a super right thing, but they're probably not going to do that. If only there were a project called Open Sherlock. Well, so... The <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it, it was actually going to be called Open Watson, but uh, um, like that. But uh, Jim a little too close to home. Jim Four said, "I don't think you want to." Yeah, do yeah. That. I don't think we <laughs> want to do that. So, so which is fine. Um, but it it it's IBM did do part of the right thing. They went around the country. They wrote a lot of papers on the technology, and they went around and lectured on it. 
So they did spread the word, but they didn't spread the code. But never mind that. It, so so JBoss did not put up a lot of documentation on the JBoss server, and it was a very complex. The whole install cycle it was it was very very complex. But they wrote a book. You had to pay sixty bucks for the you know Prentice Hall book, and then I bought it. Everybody did, but they did something else. They were they were selling service. They were selling training courses. $2,000 for a weekend of training on, on it. And then they had a series of them all the way up to certified JBoss installer. And this is the secret sauce. Now, also they did a bunch of other right things when the open source community came to them and said, we need a place to put up our versions of documents. They gave them website. So they created a community. And that community became a sales and service community with, and, and the pitch was, look, you can go and you can, you can take a lease on the Microsoft SQL server and it's gonna cost you this much per seat and this much per blah, blah, blah. Or you can pay me a thousand dollars and I'll just install the server and it's yours. And everybody started saying, that's what we want. So they grew this monstrous enterprise around sales and service. And a guy comes along from, from, the, from the Silicon Valley and walks into the JBoss office and says, here's 10 million bucks, what'll you do with it? And they said, we'll take it. And they gave him a piece of the action. And they went out and they bought up a bunch of other open source platforms that made JBoss better to ensure that they would be around. And then along comes Red Hat, who's got this thriving open source platform and no service, no sales. And they bought JBoss. And they left the entire JBoss ecosystem open source. It was not an embrace and, embrace and extinguish. They simply just bought them and kept them going. So, so that's... That's a variant of professional open source. Now, my version is I don't want the VC exit strategy. If I'm going to put up a quest as a service, I don't want uh, the profit incentive to come in and hijack it downstream. It needs to be pristine for life. And so, so that's, that's my view on this whole open source ecosystem. And professional open source. You asked about the business models. Yeah, I do think that uh, cloud services um, are, are one of the approaches is obviously sales and service and training and so on and so forth. Um, I could go deeper, but that's the surface of it. Um, wow, uh, I absolutely love that. Uh, uh, Mark, do you wanna jump in and riff on any, any or all of that? Um, I have been, uh, uh, gosh, a developer since 84. Um, it sounds, uh, that segment of the market was well covered by Jack. Um, uh, but what about, what about framings for how you would like to participate in a generative commons fueled by the stories Jack just told? What else does this mean? Cause we're trying to, we're trying to figure out what does a generative commons agreement look like? <laughs> where where people can come into the world Jack just described and the content world that Brewster Kale wrestles with every day and everything else, right? And, and uh, uh, trademarks and patents and God knows what and, and invent stuff together for the good of mankind and benefit from it individually yet, yet leave most of it, usable most of it in, the, in this commons thing. And one of my lessons in, in pursuing this, this path of logic was that a good commons kind of needs to be protected sort of like, so if, if a repo can be forked endlessly, uh, it can also be forked and then mis, you know, misused, repurposed, uh, uh, neutered, whatever. So you kind of need to know which is the legit version and which is the neutered version. And that's a form of protection is like, hey, hey, you know, ignore that fork, even though they were able to fork this, that fork basically took the fangs out of, out of what this software is supposed to be good for, Follow, you know, these, these derivatives, in fact, are really fruitful. Anyway, I'm just making this up. But 
but I'm trying to figure out like, how do we create an agreement that's useful and interesting and different from and builds on the Creative Commons, uh, AGPL, LGPL, all the kinds of things that, that Jack just told us about, but, but not just about soft shared, shared code. That's a problem I haven't solved. Um, it's been put to me by many different people. Um, I want to invent this. I don't want somebody else to patent it. Um, and uh, boy, um, worldwide protection in that um, category of you know, swimming with sharks, I have no idea. Um, you know, so, so, so rather than rather than tackling the whole enchilada of like solving for the whole problem, uh, any little pieces of that that are appealing different or any other ingredients you would add to the stew? Because I realize this is we've been sitting here having generative commons calls for a while. Uh, uh, when Michael's in the conversation, he's like, what do I do with my company playing in this pond? Like, how does that work? And we haven't actually solved those things. And we don't have a draft of a generative commons agreement. Uh, we have generativecommons.org. We own that. There's sort of nothing on it. Uh, what, what could we say? That, 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 what can we say that's additive to what already exists? Some little slice. Um, second call, um, haven't worked it out. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Yeah, yeah. and and we're at the, we're at the I top. claim ignorance. We're at the top of the hour already, so let's let's continue this next Wednesday. Is what I'm I'm thinking right now. Uh, if it, that that's okay with you all, um, but I'm really interested in this. I want to figure out how OGM can help sponsor, spark, foster, nurture, steward uh, an environment within which we actually share what we know and try to make the world better. Stacy, it's a it's a question, totally mm -hmm. different. You always ask the good questions. What would what would well? It's really outside the box question, but what would this look like if the coders didn't have to didn't have to um, depend on making their money from the code? Right, right. That, that's my question. It's, it's, that it's not that out of the box. I mean, uh, there's enough disasters happening and you know, the relief funds that went to humans during lockdown that are now being dropped and stopped were a form of an experiment of universal basic income kind of. You could look at this as one big UBI experiment and the economy is in enough like danger that UBI, that even conservatives and in particular the libertarians are like, gosh, maybe we'll need a UBI. And I'm, I'm like, wait, who said that? But I'm not even thinking about UBI because that's good. I'm thinking about the generative commons actually generating income, but not from code. And that's why I keep talking about this whole show thing. Right. I know you don't like the idea of the attention economy. I know you don't like that analogy. But when we're talking, you know, like when Jack was talking about um, only trusting a certain amount of people or you know, a lot of people talk about they don't want to do the right thing. What there are some people that it would be better if they go shopping or it would be better if they watch TV. What if something were created that they wanted to buy attention wise that was created by the good people? It's their choice. If, if I sit in front of my television every day, that's my choice. But now if I'm watching good stuff, that might help me to learn. Like mm -hmm. when Jack talked about how he told his kids, you know, ask them questions about advertising. I didn't learn that till I got to college. Mm. But I kind of had some of that in me. That's what motivated me to learn. If we had a commons that was creating content like that, that people wanted to buy into. Um, and again, this is, I stay away from, I don't understand the technology part, I'm about the social part of it. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was actually starting that experiment. Like I know you said you bought Creative Commons. Now I don't know what that means, Jack. So you know uh, I know gen generative about commons. That. Yeah. Generative okay. commons. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So I know nothing about technology, but I do understand about the fabric of, of weaving communities. And I don't want to go all over the place, but I was going to say to you, what about if as an experiment? <laughs> this is embarrassing. I would like to, what about if we, I can't even put it into words. 
if we used one of those domains and actually saw who was willing to get together and actually create a place, almost like a, a social club, where we used to have salons, like, you know, almost like a group of salons. And we just started one step at a time to see who, how that evolves. And so I would say to you, I would love to take lead on this. And if this ever generates anything, 90% of profit stays in the commons. I want 10% and expenses, just as an experiment. Somebody else comes on that says, all right, we'll help set up this space. And, and they negotiate their experiment one step at a time. But the fun part is like how I think most of us enjoyed this call. There would be lots of these calls in that social place. So well, go ahead. So you're kind of describing OGM already. Like uh, if only we knew somebody who likes to run salons, like I love running salons. If there's a good, if there's a really valid criticism of OGM, it's like, gosh, it's more like a salon than anybody who gets things done. And I'm really desperate to get more things done. But, but it, we could spawn off, we could basically sort of replicate a piece of this, name it what you'd like and, 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 let, and have you just like run it, control it, do whatever. And buying, and buying a new domain and getting a domain for an activity, piece of cake, 12 bucks, one hour later, you have a domain and a website that's online. I can do that in an instant. So the, I own a whole basket of domains because I love doing that and I've done very little with them. But, but you know, generativecommons.org was a moment, a moment to, to buy and put up. So if you wanted to buy showgame.org instead of game show uh, and start, start building something on top of it. I don't even need, but here's the thing. I don't, the game show idea was the first idea. I don't even need that. What I'm okay. talking about is many salons. So this Jerry's salon, I'm sure Gil would like a salon so I would have a salon, you know, there would so, be tons. Yeah. So, so you're also describing the idea of weaving the world and the big fungus, which is if we can all feed the big fungus, weaving the world would be one of a multitude of shows whose purpose would all be feeding the, 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 the big fungus under the generative commons umbrella, whatever the heck that means. Uh, Jack, and you have to probably leave. Yeah, so you were talking about the salon spinning out something. We already did that when, you know, I poked you one day and said, we need a way to harvest Jerry's brain out to the outer world. And you said, fine. And so we created what was called Free Jerry's Brain, FJB, and made it a private group and specifically limited to basically the, the new Dunbar number, which is five people. And we got a crap ton done. In a, in a very short period of time, and then after we had accomplished harvesting Jerry's brain out into Jason Blobs, the group sort of turned into just a, a shit pile of people gabbing like we are now. And, and you know, so I don't go to Free Jerry, Jerry's Brain anymore because it's off topic. It was created for a topic. And I would say that if you're gonna create a subject centric or topic centric guild, you should just do that that guild, you know what I mean? And then and disband it and do something else. Um, a brief tangent on Free Jerry's Brain. Love Free Jerry's Brain, been on all the calls because I'm the Jerry who's being freed. I'm not free yet, so we didn't achieve any part of that. We, we managed to export my brain somewhere, but it's not useful. And many useful things have shown up along the way. For example, <laughs> Pete, Pete would like to import the exported brain into Massive Wiki. And we, you know, Marc Antoine is building some stuff that could, could glom onto it. But partly, I would like to find funding so that those can be small funded projects that they could like actually get rewarded for, which but brings us back to the, this ecology. We did not go there. You're only just now starting to talk about finding funding. But there was there, there was a six month gap after actually getting the Jason Blobs, we should have stopped there and said, now what do we do with it? And don't let the group grow and bring in other people who don't understand the conversation and blah, blah, blah. And because it crept up from the first five people to eight or nine pretty quickly. And after that, Dunbar's out of the room. It's, he's gone. All right, go ahead, Stacey. That's the whole point of creating a space where people could go off and gab, like you said, but they still feel part of that community. And the people doing the work who also like to gab are still part of the community, but they're in the back rooms doing the work to set it up. And the only other thing I wanna say is 
the difference, the way I'm thinking, it's not about going out and getting people. It's about creating a space that people want to come to. And those people that don't believe in the generative commons that are all profit, when, when Jack talked about how they created a sales force that would do it for them, or they're gonna, need, they're gonna want to come here because the talent is gonna be here. It's not gonna be in the salons, it's gonna be in the back room. So, so the, the, the complex adaptive systems science um, says that if you want to get people to self-organize, you need fundamentally an attractor basin. You need something to do. And they, you know, um, among the stories in this space is the story of the Red Cross. The Red Cross is just a kind of a group loosely banded people until there's an emergency and then they swarm on the project, they deal with it and they disband again, okay? And so that's a model of, of, of self-organization. But self-organization has a lot of complex things inside going on, the ways of communication, the ways of tagging things, the ways of marking things, the ways of rewarding things, so on and so forth. Probably one of, I think one of the best authors in this space that's approachable is John Holland and his books on, on complex adaptive systems and emergence. These, these are books that are well worth, worth, worth studying. He talks about something called the bucket brigade as a reward system. So you got a, you got a pot of, of, of 10 units of reward and you're going to reward it to somebody for a game move. But if you, if you, if you reward them for that move, you need to reward the people that set up that move so it could be made. And so you're, you're rewarding declining pieces of that reward bit up the, up the, pole, the ladder to, to um, five, six, 10 people, whatever, that, that set up the generation, the lineage, the genome that allowed that person to accomplish that task. And so these, these are complex parts of, of a commons that need to be thought through. Is it John Henry Holland? Which of the Hollands that I just, I just showed three John Hollands that are in my brain. Uh, is it the psychologist genetic algorithm oh, guy? Uh, yeah, no, that's him. Okay, good. I'll, I'll go find more of his books and put them in. And then I was just showing a slightly macabre story that, that fits what you're saying, uh, which is this lovely TED talk uh, by Dan Barber, who talks about Eduardo Sosa, a chef who loves foie gras and hates the fact that you have to force feed geese to make foie gras. So he buys this plot of land in Spain that's just a beautiful plot of land and turns the land into heaven for geese. So basically geese make that their normal migra migration stop. It becomes Ibiza for geese. <clears throat> and then he, he harvests a few of them, and they, but they become naturally fat. And the, and the foie gras from Sousa and La Bourdette is now apparently like among the world's most, it's ethical foie gras. And it's one of the, uh, the world's uh, delicacies and, and highly prized by chefs because they can do the, the ugly foie gras thing without force feeding geese. Anyway, how do you create foie gras for, for commons nurturers, for people who want to build this stuff together, right? How do we create the conditions and the reward mechanisms? And I'm very leery of explicit reward mechanisms. So, so uh, there's a, the, you know, extrinsic rewards are different from intrinsic rewards. And when you, when you add extrinsic, you often kill intrinsic. Right. If people are motivated because they want to contribute to the commons and you suddenly say, I'm going to put a number after your name and reward you by how big your number is, that totally changes the, the dynamics of a community. So you have to be careful and delicate with it. But it's but it's important. It's really important, in particular, if you expect any humans to make a living by doing this, which we would like them to do, which then takes us back, Stacey, to what you were saying. And I was just bringing UBI into the conversation because one of the possible futures that's in our lifetimes is that we don't need to worry about making a living from the stuff we make because we'll have some sort of guarantee that uh, we can kind of you know put food on the family. How much is Facebook how worth? <laughs> how much is what worth? How much is Facebook worth? Facebook, I a whole lot. You could just do uh, market cap of Facebook uh, and and find out. I need to and I need to wrap this call pretty soon, but I change uh, change locations for a sec. But right, keep going. No, because my point is, imagine if. Imagine if we had the audience of Facebook on that generative commons link that we just talked about with the salons and we were all owners in it. Like just imagine that kind of money. Now, now people that wanted to come on, they could pay for it. 
or the services because they would find so many people within that society. I'm talking really about creating a, you know, not like, yeah, like a society of a set, but in terms of different tribes, other tribes are welcome, but if they're not in, in the beginning, they have to either decide to join and follow that culture or pay and keep their own. And that's fine. That's keeping choice in a system. Mm -hmm. And I think choice is really important. There's a whole bunch of levers of system design and you, you're mentioning a bunch of them here. And I think that we'd have to think through where's the system, what's the core, who joins how, all these protocols, and some of which we've been wrestling around like for ODM itself and haven't really like landed on, on things. But um, but I like where you're, where you're pointing. I, I happen to think it would be enjoyable if a handful of people wanted to have a call and just dream a little, just imagine just the first step. And to me, the first step is, all right, so we're gonna, we're gonna set up this thing. Who, want, who wants to play? Raise your hand. I mm -hmm. mean, we're, you know, just to start and see what happens and see the conflicts. Agreed. Um, I've got to shift places entirely. So I, we should probably wrap the call. This has been awesome. I think we can pick up here for, for next Wednesday. Go ahead, Stacey. Would it be possible to, I don't know how much effort it takes to get a transcript of today's call? Um, so, so the only calls that automatically get transcribed are the Thursday check-in calls because we're using Collective Next Zoom and they pay like an enterprise Zoom account, which has otter.ai attached to it. Um, and otter does the transcripts. Pete Kaminsky uses Amazon Web Services translation somehow magically. I don't know, but we could do that. Uh, we just, I, and I'm going to download the audio and the video and the, and the chat you know, from Zoom momentarily when Zoom says they're prepared for me. Uh, and yeah, I'll maybe upload I'll ask somebody to do it for me. I'll, I'll transfer the call to them and ask them. But also like I will I will automatic I will automatically I will upload this call to YouTube as I always do. And I don't know what the policy is, but YouTube often generates auto automatically generates transcripts for for many videos. I don't know if they do them for all of them, a few of them or what, but I've I've mysteriously discovered that many, many videos of mine just have a transcript all of a sudden. I'm like, damn, that was good. Um, so I don't know if they, if they, I don't know if you, if you want to discover whether they it would be a great, it would really be good with that transcript because then we could go through like each part and see. Yeah. Okay. Thank cool. you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you guys.